All right. Good morning. I think everybody. I think everybody decided to come to the second service this morning and first. Where is everybody? It's okay, because guess what? You're here, and you're the ones that matter, right? So this morning, Corey, Luann, Hannah, Eric, and Lucas are all gone. So there is no leadership here. Yeah, so I'm going to do everything this morning. Not really. Anyways, all right, I'm here for announcements. All right, first off, trunk or treat this Saturday if you'd like to help. You can call or text the church phone and say, I want to help at Trunk or Treat. It's going to be right here on Main Street in Rathdrum. If you'd like to bring candy, you can bring it by the church anytime this week. I think we still need a lot. I ate half of it, so you might want to get some more. I didn't really. Um, you can drop it at the church, but call first because we're not sure when they're going to come back. So I'm just kidding. They're going to be back. But all right, men's breakfast, November 19th, Saturday, 8 a.m., right here in the McCartney building. Come on out. Food, fellowship, worship teaching, all that good stuff. Men, you can bring your sons too. It's all right. Turkey Bowl, Thursday, November 24th, 9 o'clock, Lakeland Junior High football field for anybody who wants to play flag, not tackle football. But it was just contact sport, just so you know. So that's at 9 o'clock. Come on out. Either you can cheer us on, you can play, you can heckle. I'm sure Corey will be out there with his speaker heckling like he always does. It'd be fun. Corey? can't say anything about me because I probably won't play because I'll probably break my arm if I do. And lastly, um, Carrie Joe Wagner's Memorial Service Celebration of Life will be here on November Saturday, November 5th. So a week from this coming Saturday, November 5th, I believe at 2 p.m. Uh, will more info to come? Did it say it right there? Hey, look, it says 2 p.m. right here. So um, encourage all of you to, to be here to support Jeff. Uh, also, so you know, today uh, is her birthday. So it's her first birthday in heaven. And so uh, we're, we're jealous because she gets to celebrate her birthdays there and we have to celebrate ours here. So, but soon. Amen? All right. I'll hand this over to Scott. Well, one of the things that we're told to do... Uh, by Jesus himself, is if we have burdens that are too great for us to bear by ourselves, he wants that. He wants to bear that for us. And we're also told by Paul in Galatians that we are to bear the burdens of others that are too great for an individual to carry on their own. So what we have time for here is just prayer that we can pray together. We can share those burdens that we can carry them and support each other. So one thing that I just want to start with is that normally, of course, up front here we see Tamara and Bruce, and I'm not sure if you've seen on band, if you don't follow on band, you haven't seen that Tamara has a new diagnosis of cancer. Uh, and so that was just discovered this week. And so they're in for, you know, whatever that entails. And we certainly pray that it is a short uh, road, but they, I think, are, are just relying on God for what he'll do. So I just wanted to, to open and, and pray for that initially. So, dear God, thank you so much uh, the, that you have brought Tamara and Bruce to our body, uh, that we have this chance to, to help them in this burden, uh, at this moment just through prayer, but in whatever they might need. And we pray, God, that, that you would be so gracious as to just heal Tamara, that, uh, that colon cancer, kidney cancer would just be miraculously gone, just a, a, a glorifying sign of you and your healing touch. But we know that ultimately you will heal all of us, and it may just not be today. And so, God, please be with them. Please give them peace, uh, and please help us to know how to help. We pray this in your name. Amen. Is there anything else, any other prayer requests that you might have? Yes. And I'm going to ask your name, please. Diana. Yes, thank you. So, Yulia, would you be able to pray for Diana?
Amen. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Jen. Yes, we will definitely pray for that, for Hope, uh, who's soon to actually give birth, for Isaac to support them, and then their, just their new life as parents. Uh, Josh, would you be able to pray for that, please? Thank you. Anything else? No. So it is a fearsome world out there, right? And we can be fearful, I think. I don't think that's unusual. We saw that with the disciples after Christ was crucified in the room, fearful. And what does Jesus say when he comes into them? Oh, you bunch of slackers. Oh, why aren't you out there? I showed you so much. No, he sees him fearfully and he says, peace. So we just want to pray for that peace. And then after he says peace, he goes, because my father, just like my father sent me, I'm sending you. So even though it looks that way on the outside, we know that Jesus can give us that peace because we're now going out. So let's just pray for our time here uh, before we uh, begin and hear Gary's message because I just think it's very important that we realize that Jesus does give us that peace and that we have a purpose, and that is because he's sending us. So, dear God, thank you so much for what you have done with your church since its inception, God, that you bring the peace to it, that you understand that we can be fearful, that you want to send us, which is just so amazing to me. But, God, that is your plan. So please give us the strength to do that. Please give us the peace that we need. We pray for our time here. We pray for Gary as he preaches your word, your truth, and that we would take it to heart that you would teach us. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand up and greet each other.
All right, you can remain standing. Or you can sit if you want. It's up to you. Let's worship the Lord who has done great things. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You've been faithful. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the Our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Sing hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. Amen. Lord, we worship you this morning. The God who has done will continue to do great things, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We can be here this morning to worship you, to hear from your word. Speak to our hearts this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Well, good morning. You guys didn't get the memo, did you? Everyone else heard that I was preaching today, so they're not here, did they? Sorry. <laughs> so it's a beautiful morning. It's good to see your expectant faces. I'm sure we'll wipe that off pretty quickly here with, uh, <laughs> with what we're going to study this morning. But uh, if you haven't been blessed to not have suffered through one of my sermons before, my name's Gary, and Pastor Corey, you, you made the mistake that church is empty now, so... Um, <laughs> but he is, is uh, as John said, he's down ministering to the young, young adults this weekend. I just pray that this huge sacrifice on your part will be a large blessing on, the, on their behalf uh, today. 
So it looks like summer is truly over, isn't it? We've had that last bit of warmth, and now we're on to the fall. And for many people, the fall is a favorite time of year, crispness of the air, the leaves turn all those glorious colors, and it's just sort of invigorating. But for others, um, imagery of fall brings other notions to mind. It's a reminder of all that's wrong in our world, his leaves turn brown and lifeless and get blown off the tree and scatter Lord knows where. The cold wind brings a chill to their spine. And it's a reminder of all that's wrong in this world. Lack of warmth, lack of fellowship, love, maybe even a sense of abandonment. And our scripture today is kind of focused on that group of people. Last week, if you were here, Pastor Eric reminded us that we who are strong have an obligation to, to minister to the people who are weak. But how do we identify these people, especially if they're Christians, right? A lot of Christians have this notion that we always have to put on a good, good face. We have joy in Christ, therefore we always have to be joyful. So how do we find the weak, and who are they? Are they the immature in Christ? Are they the weak? Person struggling against persistent sin? Person who's suffered a grievous loss? What about someone who might be in church leadership and they're having a crisis of faith? Are they the weak? And if so, how do we minister to these people? So with all these questions in mind, if you would, as Corey has us, if we'd stand out of respect for reading God's word, turn to Psalm 88. If you have your Bibles with you, Psalm 88, it's just about right in the middle of your Bible. Won't tell you a page number, although on mine it's on page 863. And uh, we'll read God's word. Psalm 88, a cry of desperation. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah, for the choir director, according to the Mahalath Liana, a maskil of Haman the Ezraite. Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you, I cry out before you day and night. May my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry, for I've had enough troubles and my life is near shale. I am counted among those going down to the pit. I am like a man without strength, abandoned among the dead. I am like the slain lying in the grave, whom you no longer remember, and who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest part of the pit, in the darkest places, in the depths. Your wrath weighs heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. Selah. You have distanced my friends from me. You have made me repulsive to them. I am shut in and cannot go out. My eyes are worn out from crying. Lord, I cry out to you all day long. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do departed spirits rise up to praise you? Will your faithful love be declared in the grave? Your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? But I call to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer meets you. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? From my youth, I have been afflicted and near death. I suffer your horrors. I'm desperate. Your wrath sweeps over me. Your terrors destroy me. They surround me like water all day long. They close in on me from every side. You have distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. Um, Lord, this is a hard psalm, but you have it in your word for a reason. So, Lord, we just pray today, Holy Spirit, that you would come upon us, that you would open our minds and our hearts to why you have this psalm in your book and what we're to learn from it. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> One of the things I really love about the Bible is that it's real. It's real in the sense that the people and the events in it can, that it tells us about can be verified. As uh, Pastor Corey loves to point out, 
archaeology has given us all sorts of evidence of the existence of the people that are recounted in all these books, especially in the Old Testament. I love the way it's written. It's not written like some sort of mythology or fantasy or science fiction. As a brother pointed out earlier, you know, if you're trying to make up a religion, why would you put the book of Chronicles in here, right? It reads like the county records. So-and-so begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so. By the way, I will never be brave enough to try to teach you the Chronicles things. But in any case, it's, it's real. It's real in the way... It depicts how we, as human beings, encounter and deal with the situations we feel, face in life. We see people loving and hating. We see people persevering and others quitting. We see people of incredible faith, and we see people of no faith. And we see people experiencing incredible highs and joy in the Lord, and we see people experience deep dark lows and un unmentionable tragedies. And it seems that the writer of Psalm 88 certainly fits into that category, doesn't he? We don't know the exact identity of the author of this psalm, Haman the Ezraite. There's many um, differing opinions on who he was exactly, and that doesn't really matter. There is consensus, though, that he was a prominent member of the community. He was respected, and he was a man of faith. So Psalm 88 falls into a category of psalms known as a lament. There are a lot of psalms that describe laments like that. Other books in the Bible that, that, are in that demonstrate laments, well, Lamentations, Job, um, and some of the works of the prophets. A lament, if you're wondering what that is, is a plea. It's an entreaty towards God. It can even be an accusation towards God about a grave injustice or evil. And that's what a lament is. At various times in the Psalms, we see David lamenting as he's crying out, as his life is threatened. And he doesn't understand why Saul hates him so much. He just knows that he's trying to kill him. Or corporately, usually after a period of great apostasy, we see the whole tribe of Israel come together and cry out as a group passionately to God. Oh, God, please take us out of this situation. Return to us. Fulfill your promise towards us. They lament as a group. And this is something I think we as a modern church have lost. When's the last time we had an evening where they said, hey, they put on the schedule, hey, come on out on October 31st for an evening of wailing and lamenting to our God. We just don't do that, do we? That doesn't mean we shouldn't, though. One of the commentators I looked at, this is our framed his whole look at this book around the fact that we as Christians generally don't lament that we're to be praiseful and joyful. So he looked at the fact that the people back in the time the lament, the, this um, psalm was written, that the people in the Old Testament period there didn't really have a concept of life after death. So he did his whole commentary based around the part of the, like verse 10 where the psalmist said, do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed spirits rise up to praise you? So it was just a deprivation of why he wouldn't be able to praise God. So his lament is due to his lack of understanding of life, death, and the resurrection. But I think this interpretation is incorrect because the theology of the contemporary church, as I mentioned, has been shaped by our perception of how we should act in light of the resurrection of Christ. And it's been further shaped by um, a theodicy, which is basically an explanation of why God allows certain things to happen in our life. And this, this theodicy is, is made from Christian philosophers who try to seek answers. And I'm sure we've all heard this question. Well, if you have such a just, loving God, why is there so much evil and hatred in the world? It's kind of a hard question to answer, isn't it? So what, what these people have come up with is what's called the greater good argument. This greater good argument 
seeks to justify how a just and loving God can allow so much evil, both physical and spiritual, to exist in his good creation. We'll talk a little bit more about this a little later on. Now, what makes Psalm 88 unique, and I'm sure you, you, it hits you in the face as we were reading it, it's unsettling, is that it doesn't conclude by turning to a voice of hope, does it? It just ends abruptly, starkly. The psalmist said, you of distant loved one and neighbor from me, darkness is my only friend. Now, that's almost like a slap in the face. In addition to that ending, the overall tone really isn't one of adoration, is it? The psalmist said, you have put me in the lowest parts of the pit. As he's speaking to God, your wrath weighs on me. You've overwhelmed me. You've distanced me. You have made me repulsive. Why do you reject me? So he's pointing his finger and, and jabbing it into God's chest like, hey, hey. Now, to me, that points to the author's state of mind. He's in a state of desperation. And I think he slipped into bitterness and anger. And he's angry that God hasn't relieved him of what he's been praying for day and night. He hasn't taken the burden from him. What are we to make of this? How do we deal with this? Why is the psalmist Haman blaming God for the troubles he's experiencing? I mean, does he really have faith in the Lord if he's blaming him for the troubles he's facing? Is God to blame for the horrors he's facing? Well, to answer the first question, I think all we have to do is look at verse 1 and 2, and we'll see that he does have faith in God. He starts out saying, Lord God of my salvation, I cry out to you day and night. Now, this is one of those instances where we're poorer for reading an English translation and not the English text, or original text, I'm sorry. Because in the original text, he used the term Yahweh to refer to God. Now, according to rabbinical traditions, when the Old Testament saints used Yahweh, they were speaking of God as Savior, as a God of mercy. When they used the term Elohim, it's speaking of God's righteousness. So in this time, he's speaking to God, his Savior, Yahweh. He's crying out to him. So the psalmist, in other words, does recognize that God is merciful and that he is the source of his salvation. And evidently, his faith in God is shown by the fact that he cries out to him day and night. He's always going before him in prayer and supplication. And he realizes that God actually is a God who hears and responds to prayer. Verse 2, may my prayer reach your presence, listens to, listen to me, and cry. Again, he's acknowledging this. He says, Lord, I know you hear me. I know you respond. But... Because of the position he's in, because of how long he's been suffering with his affliction or whatever persecution he's facing, and he's been pleading for so long, he's at his wit's end. He's now thinking, something's gone wrong here. My phone line's been cut. I'm, God's just not hearing what I'm asking him. From his perspective, God's just not there. Well, as we go on, verses 3 through 5 describe the psalm's mental state. Again, desperation. Now, again, whether he's suffering from a physical problem or a spiritual one, it really doesn't matter. We've all been there, right? When we've been so sick that it feels like, oh my gosh, Lord, where are you? Why, why, why don't you heal me? Or maybe even worse, when we've had those times of depression where it seems like Whatever's causing this depression is just hanging over us, and we pray the Lord for relief, and it just seems like he's not hearing us. His perception is that he's near death. For I've had enough troubles, and my life is near Sheol. I'm counted among those going down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength, abandoned among the dead. I'm slain, lying in the grave, whom you no longer remember and who are cut off from your care. Now, remember I told you at this time, 
They didn't believe in a life after death. They did, so a lot of them did believe in a resurrection, but no life in this in-between state. And so the, the imagery here, if you caught it, is that of a mass grave. He said, I'm like those going down into the grave whom you won't remember. So he's thinking, God, I'm, I'm at this point where I feel anonymous, almost invisible to you. And I'm crying out to you. He's yearning. He's aching. And the strain on him is unbearable. I'm slain, lying in the grave. And yet he still persists in pleading with God. He says, Lord, if, if, if I die, how am I to bring you glory? Again, it shows his great faith. Now, Verses 6 through 10, a lot of these, this, these I think are the harshest in it because, you know, he's, as I said, in his anguish, he's pointing his finger into God's chest. And, and some of you, you might even think this is a bit sinful, isn't it? I mean, who are we to point our finger into God's chest? Look at his words. You have put me in the lowest part of the pit, in the darkest places, in the depths. Your wrath weighs heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You've distanced my friends from me. You have made me repulsive to them. I'm shut in and cannot go out. My eyes are worn out from crying. Lord, I cry out all day long. I've spread my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Five times in these four verses, he's laying blame for his condition on the road. Is he wrong? Can God be blamed? Or is he unjustly blaming God for his condition? Do we have another instance in the Bible where we hear of a man lamenting of his condition over and over again? And think of that, how that occurred. I'm talking about the book of Job, right? In the book of Job, when we first start reading, we see Satan prowling about. And God asks him what he's doing. He says, I'm looking for someone. <laughs> Satan answered the Lord as after God had said, Consider Job. And Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household and everything he owns? You've blessed the work of his hands, his possessions, increased his land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord told Satan. Everything he owns is in your power. However, you must not lay a hand on Job himself. Considered my servant? Go ahead. Test him. <laughs> Job was right, wasn't he? As he lamented to God over his condition. Now, don't misunderstand me. We don't know that much about Haman. I'm not saying that like Job, that he was a man upright in integrity before the Lord. But from our human perspective and from his perspective, there's certainly a lot of things that happen in our lives that we don't understand that seem unjust, don't they? Maybe even cruel. Perhaps a child born with a rare genetic disorder. We see that and we ask, why God? And we certainly wouldn't want to lay blame on that, on the parents, would we? Because that would be unjust. And I hope we wouldn't judge those parents harshly as they cry out to God, asking him, why, Lord, why did you afflict my beautiful child? So getting back to the psalm, I hope, even though those verses were kind of harsh, I hope we can sympathize with the psalmist for blaming God for his affliction. Much like the parents with that child of a rare genetic disorder, the psalmist doesn't understand why he's been afflicted. He's lamenting the fact that he's prayed, cried out repeatedly to God, and he hasn't received an answer. He's distressed. And this passage, again, illustrates why the Bible is so believable, so real. I'm sure there isn't a person in this room, well, maybe not for some of you young ones, but especially all of the rest with gray hair or no hair, We've had a period of time where we felt 
something similar to the psalmist. We've had those dry times in our walk where we feel abandoned, where we've seen family members suffering horribly, and we just wonder why. And we pray, and we keep going to God, and nothing happens. It doesn't get relieved. I understand that. I'm coming out of a time like that, a time of dryness, where I've asked the Lord, why? Why is all this happening? And I haven't had an answer. If we're, if we're really honest, it's really hard for us to reconcile the amount of pain, suffering, hatred, tragic, senseless loss of life in our world with our just and loving God, isn't it? It's really hard to wrap our hands, our minds around that. And I, as I said before, that led theologians to come up with this greater good argument. We try to explain this away. So it seeks, it seeks to explain how a just and loving God can allow so much pain and suffering to exist. And in a simplistic form, it boils down to this, that God has allowed a minimal amount, the minimal amount of evil to exist in the world so that we can have a maximal amount of good happen. We know there are times when bad things can happen, and five years down the road, we've seen good come of it. But do we always, should we always build a theology around that? I don't know. I don't think so. Because the way it affects us a lot of times is, well, as Eric pointed out last week, how do we know the w who the weak are when we all think we need to be joyful and upright all the time as Christians? Because we do have the hope of Christ in us, yes. But we still have our human tents, don't we? And it, it kind of distorts how we interpret some parts of the Bible. A lot of people will use Romans 8.28 to rationalize evil away, won't they? But I'll tell you what, if someone had just experienced a horrific loss of a child, or maybe had a daughter brutally raped, or maybe their house burned down to the ground and their grandmother was in it, if you walked up to them and said, well, at least we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, I think you might get a punch in the face, wouldn't you? I think you deserve it, too. Because that doesn't seem like that fits, does it? Maybe a better response on our part would be to imitate, imitate the psalmist here, to cry out in anguish with those suffering, those that are enduring trials, to lament with them. It might be a radical concept to you, but it is biblical. We saw it happening all the time in the Bible. And if it's one thing, if there's one thing I've learned about our God, he's more than able to handle any accusations we can hurl his way. He's much bigger than that. Maybe, maybe the lesson from this psalm that we can draw out is that God wants to hear his children cry out. He wants to hear his church lament with him over all the horrors and tragedies that, that we've inflicted upon his good creation. Let's move on. Verses 10 to 12, we see the psalmist appealing to God, again, by pointing out his belief that if he dies, he will no longer be able to bring praise to God. Do departed spirits rise up to praise you? Will for your faithful love be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? And we can see these are rhetorical questions. Again, they, they show us that this psalmist really does have faith in God. He acknowledges that, hey, his proper place as a human being, our proper place as God's people is to praise him and bring him glory, right? So he's asking God, hey, if I'm dead, if, I, if I'm no longer existing, how can I bring praise to you? So, Lord, take this burden from me so that I can praise you. But again, he just fears that God isn't hearing him. Verse 13, I call to you for help. 
in the morning my prayer re- meets you. Again, do you hear his desperation? He says, Sin, I've been, I've been on my knees, face down in the dirt. Why don't you answer me? His affliction's unbearable. And he feels like he's being punished and he doesn't understand why. Has anyone ever been in that situation? My perspective, my perspective is that I've, I've been a faithful servant, Lord. Why is this happening? Why are you ignoring me? He even says this has been happening from when he was young. From my youth, I have been afflicted in near death. I suffer your horrors. I'm desperate. Your wrath sweeps over me. Your terrors destroy me. They surround me like water all day long. They close in on me on every side. The imagery here is that he's in the middle of a large lake or even the ocean. And he's been treading water for so long and he's exhausted and he's about to slip below the water and drown. And he's so far off the shore that no one can hear his cries for help. And he's been lifting up his face to heaven. Oh, God, you haven't answered. I'm about to go under. He's overwhelmed by the troubles and anxieties of the world. Literally at the end of his rope. And he finishes by saying, you have distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my own. It's hard. Looks like I've succeeded in depressing him. And we might ask the question, so then why did our good, gracious, and merciful Father allow such a mournful, desperate, even angry psalm in his good book? And at the risk of sounding trite, I'm going to answer rhetorically, well, that's life, isn't it? Again, our Bible tells us about how things are this side of heaven as they really are at the present time. Sometimes we encounter frustration. Sometimes we're angry. Sometimes even we get to a point of desperation. And the Bible doesn't gloss this over. Again, if we're honest, there's so many things that happen in this world that are hard to justify with our knowledge that we know our God is merciful, he's just, and he's loving. It's hard to see how a child suffering horribly from a disease somehow brings about a greater good. It's difficult to see how it could possibly be for the greater good when we hear of a story of someone who's sold out for Christ living their life to bring him glory, and then they're taken out in a tragic accident by a drunk driver. It's hard to wrap our minds around how it can possibly be for the greater good that we see an entire continent struck with drought and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, starving and in tragic situations. It's hard to see how it's for the greater good when some maniac ruler of a country decides he's going to invade another country and starts shelling cities with civilian population. It's just hard to see anything good in that. But maybe what we need to do is humbly acknowledge like Job, and I love the finishing of Job, the ending of Job, where he realizes that God is so much greater than he is. Maybe we need to acknowledge that there are things that we just can't comprehend in this world, that this side of heaven, they're never going to make sense. Perhaps the answer is that we, as God's children, as his church, need to come together corporately and lament over the evils and tragedies that are marring his good creation. Maybe rather than trying to make a defense for God, our good, gracious, merciful God, who, by the way, does not need defending by us puny little people, 
Maybe what we need to do as a church is cry out, wail, and protest against all the evil and injustices in the world to lament to him about all the things that I know that he laments over. Perhaps the point is for us to be as brokenhearted over the condition of mankind as God is. For us to weep over the things that he weeps over. Now again, I know that as Christians, you might be thinking, but what about the fruit of the Spirit, Gary? We're, we're supposed to show that, right? We're to be lights of the world. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Yes, in its appropriate time. Yes, of course. But did you know that in the New Testament alone, I did a word study. In the New Testament alone, there are words like endure, endurance, persevere, perseverance and struggle almost 60 times in the New Testament. That's reality. Think of another thing. On his last night of freedom, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying, what was he praying for? To escape the judgment that he took on for us, for all the evil injustices, to the point of sweating blood. Do you think he was just praying praises to the Lord at that point? No, he's saying, God, I don't, Father, I don't want to go through this. This is horrible. My soul aches over this. And nevertheless, the amazing part is, what he's saying, no, but your will be done. And furthermore, he went to the cross for us. Because as Jesus himself said, that God so loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world that, it might, that he might condemn the world, but the world would be saved through him. God knows what it's like for us. He came and walked in our shoes. He knows what it's like to be finite, limited, and human and to see life as we see it. By the way, John 3.16, you all know it. You know, we put it on banners, right? As an apologist, let me tell you something. That is a unique scripture. You can look at all the other religious writings in the world. There is not one other religion in the world that says that God sent his son to take on sin for us so that we might be saved. That's powerful, guys. We've read it so many times that it's just part of us, but that's powerful. That's a powerful apologetic. Psalm 88 certainly isn't uplifting, is it? I don't think anybody's going to say, man, I want to go home today and read this over and over. It doesn't bring us a lot of joy, but it does depict life this side of heaven, doesn't it? The reality of it, anguish desperation. And as you read it, or you think about it, when you feel that you're in the right frame of mind, or if you're in the same frame of mind as the psalmist was when he wrote this, it does point you in the right direction, doesn't it? Because over and over again, what does he do? He laments to God. He cries out to him. So let me tell you something. This is much better than you know, an atheist who could think, you know, I, I think it was Rob Bell. He was a prominent Christian preacher and author, right? He walks away from the faith. Why? Because he says there's too much evil and suffering in the world. How can there be a good God? And I'm, sin I'm sitting there reading this, and I'm going, well, how can walking away from God make this any better? It gets worse, because that means there's no hope at all, right? Nietzsche said, if God is dead, then we are orphans without hope. And he lived out what he believed because he's the one that proclaimed God is dead. What happened to him? He ended up his life insane. And by the way, Nietzsche's dead. <laughs> the psalmist here points us in the right direction. 
as does the teacher in, the, in his summation of the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commands because this is for all humanity. And then there's a little note here. For God will bring every act into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. All the injustices that we see break our heart. God will bring that to justice. It's been a really hard study for me to teach. And, you know, people that have preached can tell you that it seems like all the time that you get up here and, and you're preaching to yourself. I felt the Lord's crosshairs right on my forehead through this. But I'll tell you what. This message, this psalm, has helped me to come out of a very dry spell in my life where I was angry at God because I was looking at what was going on in the world, in our country, and I went, Lord, how can you allow this? Why don't you just come and, and do something? I don't know what. You're God. But it's okay. We can cry out to our Lord. So my prayer is that if you're in a bad spot, uh, place today, whether you're suffering a physical malady, whether you're, you're in a depression, whether you're, you're, you're crying out because family members are suffering or friends are suffering and you just don't understand why, if you're in a hopeless situation, just remember, God does hear you and he wants to hear you he wants to hear your lamentations and even if you get angry as this psalmist did and you begin thrusting your finger in God's chest it's okay trust me our God is more than big enough and great enough and merciful enough to take care of you there's no accusation we can shout at him that will stick because he's God and he's sovereign. If you're fortunate to be one of those people right now where you're experiencing one of those times of great blessings and joy, as Eric said last week, you who are strong, maybe this is the time to come along, a brother or sister, who's going through that period of dryness, of trial, of lamentation, and rather than trying to say something trite with to them to encourage them, maybe what we need to do is just come alongside them and wail with them and lament with them, just to be with them. As Paul said, weep with those who weep. Finally, <clears throat> no matter which group or which camp you find yourself in, we can all because of Jesus, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, and most of all, be persistent in, in prayer. Our great Lord and Savior has overcome the evil one. We're not alone in this. I think it was George Mueller I heard someone asked of him, how, how do you stay faithful to the mission that the Lord has sent you to, to your calling. Because we know that Mueller never had enough money for all the orphans. He was always on his knees in prayer. And he said, I spend 30 minutes a day thinking about heaven. Wow. If you're in that dark spot, spend 30 minutes thinking about heaven. I think the Lord will meet you there and minister to you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you don't disguise life as it is, that your book isn't just of an uplifting comedy, Lord, but that there's tragedy in it too. And you show us how people have reacted to their circumstances, their trials. And you show us how we can too, Lord. And we thank you that we're able to wail and to lament and to come before you 
and not understand what's going on, but to just cry out to you, Lord, because we know that ultimately all things will be brought to light, that you will make all things new, and that we will get to be there in heaven with you, rejoicing with you, Jesus. So, Lord God, we pray that at this time that you would show open our eyes if we're in that high spot, that, that we would seek out those that are in desperation and in need of of comfort, Lord, that we would just come alongside them. And Lord, if if we're one of those people that are crying out, help us to not hide, to isolate ourselves, but to accept the love and mercy that comes from being with a fellow believer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless words. you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not Search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm so
too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now. I'm laying it down. I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. saw my condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend, all I know is I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 my heart has been in your sights long before my first breath, running into Running to life from death. I feel this rush deep in my chest. I miss he is calling out. Just as I am, you pull me in. And I know I need you now. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 again and again.
Jesus, you be lifted high. You be lifted high. You be lifted high. You be lifted high, be lifted high in my life, oh God. And I fall to my knees so it's you that they see not I Jesus you be lifted high and even now that I'm inside your hands help me not to grow prideful of Don't let me forsake sacrifice. Jesus, you be. to my knees so it's you that they see not I Jesus you be lifted high and if I'm blessed with the riches of kings how could I ever think that it was me for you brought me from darkness to light Jesus you be lifted high, lifted high. you fall to my knees so it's you that they see not I Jesus you be lifted high open our eyes to see the things that make your heart cry to be the church that you would desire, your light to be seen. Break down our pride and all the walls we built up inside, our earthly crowns. Our God. 
that be true, Lord, that no matter what is taking place in our lives, Lord, no matter the desperation, the struggle, the trial, the lamentation, Lord, that we would still shout forth your praise. God, we know there is a time to weep. There's a time to mourn. But we thank you, Lord, that you turn our mourning into rejoicing. Lord, that we have the hope and the assurance, Lord, of being with you forever. Lord, we love you. We pray we would make this proclamation to the world around us today, that we would go and make Jesus known this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessings. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.